Hey, Nick, welcome to the Buy, Grow, Sell podcast. Greetings, what's going on? <laughs> Lots happening in our end of the world, uh, but appreciate you uh, you dialing in to have a chat. And uh, if correct me if I'm wrong, but you're dialing all the way in from Austin, Texas. Is that right? I'm in New York City this week, actually, but I live in Austin, Texas, but I'm in New York City this week. I've been doing a bunch of events here. Oh, fabulous. Fabulous. Well, I've been to Texas a few times, not been to Austin yet. They tell me Austin is the best city in Texas. Is that right? <laughs> I think it's great. I love it. I love it. They say it's a blueberry and a sea of tomato soup. It's nice. <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, Nick, I know we're going to uh, we're going to ultimately chat a little bit about your business museum hack that you started and founded and ultimately sold. But can you give us a little bit of your background here? Uh, you know, what, what ultimately sort of what was your business journey? What led you to starting Museum Hack? A little bit about my journey. I'm 40 years old. I have been doing business a long time. I was always in high school even and middle school. I was creating websites and I had a web hosting company that got me a really nice scholarship that got me to school where I started a software company. But all of those businesses were smaller, much smaller. And they weren't multi-million dollar companies where I had full-time employees with health insurance, um, but always had the bug of doing entrepreneurship. So that's a little bit about my background. Yeah, cool. And and I understand, um, you know, we don't have to get too much into the detail here, but I guess um, I understand your background. You you did work in a family business as well. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, I helped grow our family business. My dad started a avionics company. We actually did business with a couple of firms down there in Australia for some helicopters. And basically cool. we made, my dad started this in the basement of our house. When I joined, there was probably, my dad was working on it, my mother full time. They had one employee maybe that I helped them hire. And uh, we grew it to about 70 employees over about 10 years working together and then sold it to a private equity firm in 2014. Yeah, interesting, interesting. So, so I'm hearing that, you know, business is, sounds like it was in your blood. It's not my first rodeo, that's for sure. And I think that helped in selling Museum Hack of knowing the process of working myself out of a job, hiring a CEO, a chief of staff to help run it and things like that. Certainly, yeah. Yeah, yeah cool. So talk to me a bit about Museum Hack. I mean, I, I, I did cheat. I have seen a little bit of you online. So uh, I understand museums weren't necessarily your main thing. <laughs> Museum Hack is probably one of the weirdest businesses that you've had on this podcast because it was a services business, not scalable. It was live museum tours. So I know down in Sydney and Melbourne, there's some beautiful museums that are large and that can be frankly intimidating. Well, here in New York City, we have the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is enormous. I mean, it's 13 acres, it's 2.3 million square feet. And it was so big and intimidating that I kind of hated it. And uh, most of my friends didn't go there. It's just too big. So anyhow, I started to do these tours and what the business was, was live museum tours. So imagine you come to the museum and there's a tour guide who's gonna show you around for two hours. But instead of working for the museum, he worked for me. And I would hire stand-up comedians or Broadway actors or science teachers, musicians, these crazy people to be the tour guides and tell you the juicy gossip and the backstory. That's the general gist of what the business was. Yeah, cool, cool. And so, you know, what, what led you to starting an idea, a business like this? You know, I never wanted to make it a business. This was really a passion project. And I'll go ahead for the spoiler alert for people listening. You know, this wasn't a scalable software company. So even though when I sold the business, we had about 50 employees, it was not that high revenue. We, we never actually broke $3 million in revenue, even with all those employees. What made me want to do it as a business, though? It was just I needed to grow. I wanted to reach more people and change the way that adult museum tours. I think adults want fun museum experiences. And I was tapped out. I could only give a certain number of tours. One time this thing happened where this blog wrote about my museum tours. And literally the next day, because the blog was very popular, it was called Daily Candy. And they said that my museum tours were the best thing to do in New York City. And literally the next day, I got 1,300 emails from people wanting to join a tour. So I was like, oh my God, I have to hire more people. 
<laughs> nice way to grow, though. That's fantastic. For sure. And so um, I imagine you just charged, uh, people charged a fee. Did they book online? What was the mechanics? How did it, how did it work? It's funny. During the early days, I would charge cash. And during the first museum tours, because I did it for fun, for free, for my friends for two years. I never thought I'd charge for it. It was just a hobby. And the first people I actually charged for, I had so much fun afterwards. I was like, this feels weird to take your money. I gave them their money back. And I thought, <laughs> I think they probably thought that that was pretty weird. Um, but I think that's a good way to start a business. When you truly love it and you're building something for yourself and for your friends, there's something very, very special about that, about grinding on nights and weekends on a business that you're so passionate about. Um, yes, yeah, so eventually we started to sell the tickets online. We would advertise it as a waiting list. You could skip the waiting list by paying. And the real secret, the economic engine of our company was that, yeah, we were popular on um, TripAdvisor and some other websites, but we made the most money when we would sell these tours at the museum as a team building tour or a team building experience. And those team building tours for us, we could charge a lot more money and get bigger groups of people. So that was successful for us. Yeah, interesting. So just targeting corporates and stuff like that, was it? Exactly. Targeting a corporate group who maybe wanted to have a holiday party. And I don't know if you do this in Australia, but you'd take out your corporate group to go bowling or to go, yeah. I don't know, what's some stuff you guys do there? What's an example of like a team building? Yeah, bowling's probably pretty common. I've seen laser tag. I've seen paintball. I've seen rock climbing. I've seen it all, I think. So, yeah, a go-kart racing is one I like. <laughs> laser tag, go-kart. These are all very dangerous things now that I hear about it. Very on brand for Australia. <laughs> um, and we would do it, though, at the museum. We try to convince them to come to the museum and come bring your employees for a cultural experience. And frankly, for many of these museums, we were working with small deals, $5,000, $10,000. And for the museum, these major museums we worked at, that was a little too small for them. So it was a very nice yeah. niche business for us. That's interesting. And so would you actually book the tickets to the museum for your clients? You take care of the whole experience? We did. We did. We booked the tickets yeah. for the clients. It was a one-stop shop. We handled everything. We made the reservations for them. We would handle the drinks if they had drinks or snacks. It was a very service-oriented business. Yeah, yeah. I like the fact that you said you used comedians and actors and all sorts of and scientists. I mean, you know, scientists. I'm I'm thinking not necessarily the the the, the people people kind of tour guide kind of personality that you might imagine. So, you know, that, that's a bit of a uh, well, an innovation. Or certainly thinking out of the box. It's like, how, how did that come to you? I mean, it, yeah, how did you get to that kind of idea? I'll tell you what, I never had art history training. So I never took an art history class. I didn't come from the museum world. And that is what made the tours special because I could have a fresh perspective to attract new audiences. When I would try to hire museum tour guides, they just had a lot of bad habits overall. They had ideas. It just, it wasn't good. And so I knew I had to hire from a different group. What I needed first was people who could engage and entertain. Because if yeah. I could entertain first, then I could educate my audience at the museum. But if they're not entertained, nobody cares. And so think about it, science teachers, they can engage a lot of kids, they can be alert. Stand-up comedians, they can hassle people, they can make jokes, they can razz somebody. They're the best at crowd work. Stand-up comedians were some of the best tour guides. <laughs> That's cool. I like it. It's funny. I uh, in in previous sort of roles that I've had and you know running divisions for corporates and whatever else, I I always found that hiring people from within our industry came with a whole bunch of baggage and problems, just like you've described. You know, it was it was more about you know who out there has the right kind of approach and maybe has solved similar problems that can apply those skills. And so, yeah, I just I, I like it. It's quite a quite an interesting approach. What's the name for that? It's like hire for fit or skill, not for something. Yeah. I've heard it said, I've heard it said before, which the gist is hire, hire somebody. Attitude. Yeah. Yeah. Hire somebody who yeah, can figure yeah. things out, who's got a good work ethic, who can do this, not based on their experience, because you never know if they have 20 years of experience or 21 years of doing the same exact thing every one year. 
Yeah, for sure, for sure. So, so uh, talk to me a little bit about. It. I mean, obviously, it was. Uh, I think it was a f- sort of five, six year journey of museum hack. Um, what uh, was there? I mean, at what point during that journey did you start thinking that you might want to sell the business? Selling the business is interesting, and especially for passion project companies like mine, I think many business owners assume that maybe they'll never sell. And that was the case for me, at least. I never thought that I would sell the business. I had no idea who I would sell it to. Um, And so the general gist was, of course, you have ideas. Maybe we'll sell to WeWork or somebody like that. But the idea was never really to sell because I liked a lot of the benefits that I got from the business, the perk of being the business owner and things like that. Um, I had successfully hired a CEO and a marketing director and other people to run the company for me. And the reality was that as the business continued to grow and I wasn't as involved, I did lose touch a little bit with the company and my excitement and enthusiasm maybe, you know, and it's also frustrating as an entrepreneur, you've probably worked with a lot of people who love the small business, but then it gets too big and they're like, this is not what I signed up for. Yeah, yeah. And t- talk to me a little bit about hiring that CEO. I mean, like that that must have been an interesting transition away from being, you know, not just the founder, but the the driver, the leader, the, you know, it's your passion, as you said. I mean, what was that like? I have so much respect. If anybody is able to hire a CEO for their business, I know how much work it takes. I got really lucky. I hired someone, uh, she was younger and she was less experienced and it was a real risk to hire her. And we actually hired her at the beginning as the staff manager. And then she was promoted to uh, um, chief of staff. And then she was eventually promoted to CEO. To her credit, she knew from day one that she wanted to be CEO. And it's that type of person that really you just want to get out of their way. I was never good at that. But you just want to get out of their way because there's so much. I remember the first staff meeting that she led. And it was just so I just stepped back and I was like, oh, my God. This woman is so much better than I could ever be. She understands things with people that I could never understand. And it truly is a skill set that I think there's a skill set of zero to one of starting something small, that that new idea of getting it off the ground. Um, And then there's a skill set of going one to ten and then there's ten to a hundred. And that is very, very different skill sets along the way. Mm, really, that's a that's a great insight. Did you feel any sort of pangs of guilt or awkwardness, or, or was it challenging to let go, or, or was it just such a natural fit that it just yeah, seemed obvious? Of course, there's pangs of letting go. I run in the business for so long. You know, the tours started as doing my tours. They they were all me. Yeah. The tours were me. It was my tour. And I remember one of my best friends when I hired my first tour guide. He said. You're an idiot. Why would anybody ever want to go on a tour that's not you? Like the whole thing is you. (laughs) And that was interesting, right? Um, And so that's hard. But as a CEO, you know, the real role is that they become a people manager and that it's the people and it's the people and and keeping them engaged and 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 helped and fulfilled and giving them a mission and a path and a future that I wasn't as good at and that this person, the CEO, she was just incredible at and she could she had the patience. You know, I don't have a lot of patience and she had a lot of patience to work with people. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. And so um, was there an aha moment or something where you realized you were going to sell the company or was it more? Gradual? You know, um, it was no, 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 it wasn't gradual. It was an aha moment. Because the team, the the CEO and the marketing director, they had sort of secretly started a dating relationship on the side. And wow. they they both came to me with a proposition to buy the business from me. And that's one of those moments where it's like, oh my God, is this a hostile takeover? Are they going to, <laughs> you know, are they gonna quit after this? Are they gonna start a rival company? What is gonna happen? And they knew how much that I valued the business and loved and cared about it. And so I think they were nervous about the idea as well. But again, to their credit, full, it was their idea to think about buying the business because they were already running it and they had some ideas to grow it in ways that I wasn't able to. 
Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. And so did they come to you with a number in mind already, or was it something you had to kind of work out together? They didn't have a number in mind. Um, we talked around and we asked about, you know, what do services, ba what do service based businesses sell for, right? Maybe three to five times net income it was a general gist of things that we were looking at. Um, and yep. so we did a little shopping around. We did a lot of shopping around, but but at first they were very much like, and I wrote a, a nice article on my blog about how the whole thing played out. But at first they just wanted to kind of test the waters and see whether I'd be open to and receptive to that. And for a variety of reasons I was, yep. Yeah, cool. And and was the business profitable at the time? Was it, you know, so you're obviously applying a multiple here, right? Can you tell us where you sort of settled? I don't know if you can mention the valuation, but what was the multiple maybe? Yeah, um, it's, I love to talk numbers and things like that. And it's always frustrating when somebody won't won't say the numbers. Um, as part of my sale agreement, because the business was growing a lot and the employees were so close, we agreed not to share the numbers. But I can give an idea. We did about $2.8 million in sales on the year, the last year um, um, that I was the owner. The business ultimately sold for around a 5x multiple of net income. And that is what we determined. Now, I kept about 15% of the business. And that's how, you know, that's essentially how we came up with the number. Yeah, cool. Um, most deals that I've worked on or seen and around the traps, you know, we do a lot of sort of transactions in our core business, but I, I see the consideration that's paid for a business it usually drops into one or more of the following sort of three buckets. There's cash up front, there's maybe deferred payments that are not at risk. They're just deferred. Hey, we're going to pay you a lump sum at the end of each year for the next three years type thing. And then the third bucket is, uh, is an earn out, which is obviously deferred, but at risk because certain KPIs need to be met. Can you share with us, did you tap into those buckets? How, how did it work for you? Yes, I'm really happy to share this. And so I got a higher valuation for the business because I was willing to take more risk. This was a seller finance transaction where the buyers put zero money down. And in fact, that was important to them to put zero money down. And I was willing to take that additional risk of their zero money down to say, well, OK, but I believe in them. I know I trusted them very, very deeply to be amazing business operators that I had known them for years working together. And so even though yeah. my lawyers and everybody who advised me was saying, you are an idiot. You're not going to make them put any money. You are so stupid. You're crazy. I would, you know, maybe I was a little naive or something, but I was like, I don't know. I trust them. They're very smart. Um, yeah. And so zero money down paid out over a series of time, roughly five years, I think was how long it was supposed to pay out, maybe four years. And the idea was that they could just pay out the profits of the business to me. Now, there, there were rules that if they ever missed a single payment by more than 30 days or 31 days, that the entirety of the business would transfer back to me. And there was enough cash that I left in the business or I made them loans or something like that so that that was never a serious issue. And if it was, yeah. they'd have enough runway and enough time to actually get a loan and something like that. Um, yeah. The business did have an accelerated payment plan where they could receive a slight benefit to prepaying some of that um, um, earn out, which ultimately they decided to do. And so that was nice for me on my side as well. Yeah, nice. It's, it's, it's most certainly a, I don't want to say unusual, but it's not an uncommon approach to, to structuring it or, or being willing to. So I think, I think most people are a little bit more um, worried about getting, getting their payments, but I, I, totally get the whole principle that they've been running the business. You've been out of it probably from the day to day for a while. And if anyone's actually going to keep doing a good job of it, it's going to be them. Right. Yes, exactly right. They've been, they, they knew. And to their credit, look, I'm going to tell you something special. I had tried a long time to try to grow the business above that $3 million sale figure. I had tried to hire a sales director. I had tried to grow into new sectors. And part of it, I think why I was never able to is it's the fallacy of being too close to the company, of always thinking how things had to be and what what things were that yeah. for me, I just I never was able to grow it more than that 
And thankfully, fully, fully to their credit, the business grew massively and it really worked out well for everybody involved. Yeah, interesting. Now that's great. Did, did, did your, um, you said something about payments over a four to five year period. So did they stay the same term or did they pay off quicker because they were doing so much better or like? Did, yes, yeah, exactly. Are you, that. Are, you all, are you whole now? Yeah. Yes, 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 whole. Yeah. And they actually bought out the remaining remainder side of my 15% and they've been doing okay. great. Yeah, that's great. And, and um, to, to your knowledge, has the, biz, has the business grown since, since that time? Yes, it's massively grown. They've taken it in whole new sections. They've taken things online. They've gone to new markets, to new cities. There's been a lot cool. of changes um, post COVID but they are really focused on the team building space and they've doubled down more than ever to really be the best, if not, they're probably the best provider in the entire world of team building services. And, you know, that's not at all what I thought. You know, I thought this was a museum tour company, right? And so they've yeah, had that yeah. vision, which has been neat. Yeah, that's cool. And, and was COVID a concern? I mean, obviously, museums shut down, everything else. What, what was this? This must have been just at the beginning of COVID you were going through, through the first, I guess, stages of transition. Massive concern. Massive concern. Huge cash flow, cash flow problems, employee issues, everything. It was, a, it was yeah. a, a real stressor for them. I sold the business in April, approximately, of 2019, so about a year okay. before COVID. And so this yep. was fully there. I was still involved and I let them know that I fully supported them and I wasn't trying to retake the business back from them. But it was certainly stressful, stressful, interesting times to their credit again, being very successful through all that. Yeah, that's cool. Did, did you ever have a moment in 2020 or ever where you were worried if this was still going to work out? <laughs> I think everybody did. If you didn't, then you're... Yeah then you're crazy. The whole world was turned upside down. How quickly things yeah. accelerated with all museums absolutely being shut. I mean, literally going from a $3 million a year business to zero overnight, all your revenue sources are cut off. I mean, lots of places had this. This was not unique to this tour company, but yeah, it was yeah. unique. It was stressful. Yeah, yeah. Talk to me a little bit about, I mean, I think you go on this journey of starting a business, building it, ultimately selling it, you know, and for some people, they jump back in at the beginning of that cycle and go again, right? It's, uh, you know, lots of serial entrepreneurs. You, you mentioned before that this journey, this business was service-based business and it was hard to scale. I mean, do you, do you have a different perspective on business now that you've come out that other side? You know, if you were to start another business now, do you have a view on what, what kind of area it would be in? What sort of model, that type of thing? I like creating things for my friends that I'm passionate about. And I like creating services and experiences that I truly love. I mean, I'm doing this, this new project where I'm writing a book that, that teaches people how to host a cocktail party. And that's yep. such a weird project and a weird book. And just think about my last business, though. If I were to tell you that I'm going to create a multi-million dollar company doing museum tours with stand-up comedians, you have to remember yep. 10 years ago, 15, 12 years ago, museum tours today may be more dynamic, and that, but that, that was not the case. Museums very stuffy, very conservative. Um, so now my new project, what do I know differently? What do I think about differently? Because um, I want to be helpful to listeners because your listeners are thinking about maybe selling their business one day, maybe acquiring a business, maybe starting a company yeah. and what they can do to do it better by thinking about that. Um, you know, there's common things like the amount of inventory that's kept in stock. Uh, I could share one thing. We had a one of our largest customers, our corporate clients, was going through financial difficulty during the time of the sale. And that brought such a different discount to the valuation of how we valued that client. It sounds obvious, but that was really unique. Something else. Okay, so I could share. Yeah, please. No, oh, no, I was going to ask you, that largest client, do you, do you recall just even roughly what percentage of your revenue would that client have represented? I think it was around 10%, which for us was okay. pretty considerable. Material. It was yeah. material and it was very high margin revenue as well. It was very high margin. Yeah. Here's one piece of advice that I would say. 
we spent in lawyer fees and lawyer fees and time 99% of all of our money on the securitization and the sale and the transaction of the business and that 85% that I was selling, okay? We spent everything focused on that because that was the riskiest thing. Yeah. We spent basically zero time on the 15%, on the vehicle that was going to hold and own the remainder. Yep. And as it turned out, right, that 15% that became worth a lot of money later on. And that 15%, we didn't think twice. We didn't, it was just a formality. It was just a thing that we just did. It was like, okay, and then you can have 15% of this. But like the first thing we were concerned about was paying off this loan and this. So yep. that was a real big learning experience afterwards that I would advise anyone <laughs> listening to this that I know that you're mostly focused on selling your business and making sure, but if you have a piece of the equity, which all my friends really advised me to do, and I'm so happy that I maintained 15%, they said, maybe you guys call it, um, but the same thing we call it here, we call it um, uh, sucker's insurance or schmuck insurance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. tell, tell me, with that 15%, did you, as a part of the negotiations, and you've, you know, you're, you're finalizing contracts and whatnot, did was there any sort of mechanism option that type of thing for the buyers to acquire that 15 percent later or was the it just short, a discussion later on yeah the short answer is no there was no force buy sell agreement or anything like that which i know and i've heard from people getting burned about but there was so very little thought that 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 would ever be an issue or 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 various thoughts or concerns about how that could be done and executed that in hindsight, of course, I feel like an idiot, but at the time it just, it wasn't a reality. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think, I think your experience is probably the most, the most common with people. It's they're, they're so focused, as you said, on this bucket of what is the most risky issues here. And, you know, it's almost um, a, a side consideration. So, you know, because, hey, if everything goes well, then you probably want to buy it anyway. But <laughs> so, right. so I, 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 yeah, I kind of get that. Um, out of interest, you know, and I get a lot of business owners asking me about deal structure and whether they should keep some equity. And, and of course, buyers love it because they know that you're not, you know, as a seller, you're not trying to just cut and run. You're willing to leave some equity on the table and share some risk. But um. You, the the fifteen percent when you sold it was it how did it compare to the original principal you got in terms of value? Oh, was it was it how did, yeah was it, oh was it, you said it was worth a lot more? I've I've heard occasionally where business owners go, hey man, that last twenty percent I had was worth more than the eighty percent I sold years before. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, so I think that would be really nice. I'm not at liberty. I can't say that because there's so much. The online space and the team building world and things like that, I want to respect the business owners to run the most successful business that they can. But I do want to think a little bit if what what the valuable nugget that is in there, um, I think by maintaining a piece, I can tell you how we came to the 15 percent figure. When it was 20 percent of the business that I was going to hold, they each were then only getting roughly, you know, 40% of the company. And in their mind, 40%, it didn't feel like they truly each owned the business. At 42.5%, where I'm just getting, you know, 15%, it really incentivized them. They told me that they felt more, more like an owner. Now that's, you know, because at first, maybe I said, okay, I'll keep 30%, right? And you guys have 70%, you clearly have the majority. Well, with two of them, that doesn't feel like a majority. That's 35% each compared to my 30. It feels like we're equal partners. So then we said, so that's kind of how we got to it. And that was really shocking for me to hear their perspective about those numbers. Yeah, interesting, interesting. So fast forward, talk to me a little bit about what you're doing today. You've got a book coming out. I'm kind of curious how. You came about writing that book, and what's the story there? It's a weird book. It's called The Two Hour Cocktail Party, and every business owner should probably host more dinner parties. I want to ask you, Simon, do you host dinner parties or cocktail parties? What do you do? 
No, I honestly don't. I don't. I mean, I certainly have friends over and do sort of things like that, but it's not a it's not a networking thing. It's more of a catch up thing. So I, I most certainly read the cover of your book and thought that's intriguing. I, I'm, I'm, you've got me curious. Uh, and do you have someone in your life who does host events, maybe in your friend group or something like that? It's the person who always brings people together. Think about a holiday or a sporting event, someone that always hosts at their home. Yeah, look, definitely. I've definitely got friends who are constantly hosting events, for sure. Yeah. Um, okay. The gist of my book is that person could be you. And how would your life be different? How could you meet new podcast guests, new clients, if you were the one that was the host? We find out about the best business opportunities, romantic partners, everything through the thing they call weak ties or your acquaintances or your loose connections. And I found in living in New York City, hosting hundreds of parties, that parties were the best way for me to meet people. And it's a gift. Every time you invite somebody to a party, it's a gift that you get to give them. And now I'm on a mission to teach 500 people how to host their first party and how you can do it for under 100 US dollars, how you can do it easily, stress-free. And the best part is you kick everybody out after two hours. <laughs> that's sounding more like my kind of party <laughs> that's and, good and right is, do, do you do this mostly for friends or is it kind of a is it can, can you do it more with a business as in business acquaintances or like what's what's the right vibe here you'll be the most successful when you bring together a mixed group of your friends so that can be business people that can be your friends that can be your neighbors but you become the hub the central person the connector who introduces other people. Think about it, as we get older, it's nobody teaches adults how to make new friends. Being a business yeah. owner is incredibly lonely. It's insanely lonely. Somebody told me once when I was running my business, they said, congratulations on running a business. Just know that one day all your employees are gonna have a party and you're not gonna be invited. <laughs> yeah. that's so true <laughs> it's true right oh, it's cool. sad it's yeah. sad it's lonely and as a business owner you need friends you need a peer group and maybe you've seen folks the common advice for business owners oh start a mastermind group oh start a dinner party that is good advice but those are very difficult events to host i'll be honest a dinner party a mastermind takes a lot of skills as a facilitator and many yeah. people are not they're so intimidated by it that they'll just never do it. And what I found was a two hour cocktail party. By the way, dirty secret, I don't even drink alcohol. There's not a single <laughs> drink recipe that's in my book. I wrote a book about cocktail parties. I don't even drink alcohol. <laughs> but a cocktail party is a lightweight social interaction to just come hang out, just come over, have a drink, meet some new people, right? So anyhow, yeah. that's my mission. I think business owners, Entrepreneurs should be hosting gatherings to meet people, for yeah. making clients, new people, for selling your business even, shopping it around casually. Hosting a party is all that it takes. And I found a formula, a specific way to do it with counterintuitive advice. By the way, what do you think the best day for hosting a party is? It's probably not the day you think. Well, now that you've said that, my brain is going to an obvious day. So, so okay, I would normally have guessed probably a Friday or a Saturday. Friday or Saturday, that's what most people think. The best days to host a party with my format actually are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday nights. Why is that? Yeah, right. Those are non-socially competitive nights. What's the number one fear someone has about hosting a party that nobody's gonna show up? up. Yeah. People won't turn <laughs> yeah. up, right? And so when you host on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night, it's easy, right? You give people two or three weeks notice, it gets in their calendar, you send a series of reminder messages to keep the excitement high. Um, one, Final thing is I'll talk about these parties forever, but this is something that yeah. your listeners can do for any of their events that they're hosting. Do this. I send many guest bios. It's a brief summary about the person that's coming to all the attendees beforehand. And I don't write it. It, like, it doesn't take me hours to write. It's just a little blurb about them, right? Simon lives in yeah. Australia. He hosts an amazing podcast. He helps business owners sell their business for more money than they ever could before. And they're happier when they're done with it. L listing little bios like that for everybody who attends really one drives attendance because people are like oh my gosh i i gotta go to this party to meet these people yeah. um and two it helps the introverts it helps yes. people that are a little scared and shy to attend so 
Yeah, so that's the gist. Thanks for letting me talk about it. No, my pleasure. What's the magic number? My final question. Magic number of attendees. The magic number of attendees between 15 and 20, less than 15, and you don't have enough natural energy in the room. It gets boring. Your guests can talk to anybody. It's quiet. It's not more than 20, 25. And when you do a round of icebreakers, it takes too long. And for a new host, remember, my book is about helping someone host their first event and having it going amazingly well. A new host can't manage more than 25 people. Yeah, too unruly. Nick, thank you. It's been a pleasure to chat to you. Uh, Are you happy for people to reach out and connect with you? Of course, of course. Anyone can send me a message. Uh, They can send me an email. They can reach me on social media. I'm very active on Twitter, um, Instagram. Um, I have a thing called my friend's newsletter. I send it like once a month and there's no ads. There's no spam. It's just random cool books that I read, a great um, podcast like this that I've been hosted on. So I do that. Um, and then I wrote some of these articles like how to host a networking event, how to plan a happy hour, how to host. Oh, actually, for the ladies, how to plan a clothing swap. Women go bananas for this. <laughs> and it's absolutely fun. How to host a book swap, all that stuff. I'm obsessed that like post COVID, I think adults are lonely. And, and so yeah. that's my next focus is trying to bring people together. That sounds cool. Now, final question. Where can people buy the book? They can buy the book anywhere books are sold on the internet. Please check it out. The the name of the book is called The Two Hour Cocktail Party. For any of your listeners, I will give them a satisfaction guarantee. If they don't find massive value in it, I spent over $40,000 and worked on this book for five years training about 80 people how to host a party. I think as a business owner, you got to host a party. It's lonely. You need friends. Get people together. You need it more than they do. Sounds fantastic. Nick, thanks so much for joining me on the show. Thanks for having me. Host a party. Sell your business.